The Joker, Darth Vader, Hannibal Lecter, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Some expertly crafted villains exceed the boundaries of their immense notoriety, becoming just as beloved and cherished as their heroes they antagonised. And for the Hot Rod, villainy was his civic duty, tasking himself with riling up every fan in his vicinity to the point of murderous rage. And some even made genuine attempts on Piper's life. Yes, Roddy Piper was a heel's heel, an emboldened master of his craft with the unflappable goal that allowed him to embody that role better than anyone else. And even as a brave-hearted hero, his cultured antagonism never lay too deep beneath the surface. I'm Jack from Cultaholic.com and this is the captivating career of Rowdy Roddy Piper. As a 19-year-old barnstorming drifter and former Gold Gloves boxer, Piper began wrestling in Manitoba and Ontario for Tony Condello in 1973, picking up experience working with Condello and other locals. Later that year, Piper made his way to Vern Gagne's AWA, where he was fed to a number of proven vets and up-and-coming stars. A real who's who that included superstar Billy Graham, Larry the Axe Hennig, Baron Von Raschke, and in November 1973, future ally and nemesis, a 24-year-old Ric Flair. The scrappy Piper remained an enhancement talent for AWA into the fall of 1974, after which he moved on to territories like St. Louis and Central States Wrestling. Texas was next on Piper's journey come 1975, and the young man began cutting a deeper groove in the business. In Dallas and Houston over the months ahead, Piper warred with Mad Dog Vachon, Joe Blanchard, Red Bastian, and even superstar Graham one more time. Come 76, Bastian sent Piper to work in California, where the real notoriety began to manifest. Initially, Piper was set to just be a babyface and work a few weeks, but Booker Leo Garibaldi saw too much potential in Piper as a star and Antagonist. His feud with Chavo Guerrero and, by extension, the other active Guerrero family members, stretched into 1979 and cycled through a litany of gimmick matches. It was during this period that Piper forged a real friendship with legendary tough man and promoter Gene LaBelle, who mentored the young grappler. Piper also made an indelible mark in Don Owen's Portland territory, which, for all intents and purposes, became his home. Among the highlights of Piper's time in Portland were his feud with top heel Playboy Buddy Rose, with whom he exchanged Portland's top title in 1980, as well as his multiple reigns as tag team champion including three with Rick Martel. In the fall of 1980, Piper left the Pacific Northwest behind for Jim Crockett's Mid-Atlantic Territory in the Carolinas. Very quickly, Piper captured the vacant NWA television title and, not long after, unseated Ric Flair to win the United States Championship, which he would hold for over six months. Soon enough, Piper was juggling Mid-Atlantic and Georgia, the latter of which he put his masterful speaking talents to use in as a heel commentator. Bob Armstrong, Dick Slater, Tommy Rich, and Dusty Rhodes were among just some of the babyfaces whose ire Piper Piper drew, leading to a series of heated matches. However, in the summer of 82, Piper turned face after colleague Gordon Soli was physically accosted by Don Morocco, striking back at his fellow heel in defense of Soli. Back in mid-Atlantic, Piper wrestled Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight title on Thanksgiving night 1982, drawing over 15,000 fans, a then record for their 24-minute struggle which ended with Piper being DQ'd. Perhaps Piper's most iconic pre-WWE rivalry came against Greg the Hammer Valentine, who in 83 had injured Piper's ear in a brutal assault. This set the stage for them to square off that November at the very first Starcade in a dog collar match. Amid the show-stealing bloodbath was Piper sustaining further damage to his ear, reportedly breaking his eardrum and allegedly causing legitimate hearing loss. But Piper vanquished his foe in the end anyway, one of the last hurrahs before getting that call from New York. In WWE's ambitious national expansion, their next great lead heel would be making the jump come early 84. Initially, due partly to his thinner frame looking conspicuous in a land of heavier brutes, Piper was initially put to use as a manager who occasionally wrestled. His charges were Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and Dr. D. David Schultz, but before long, the confrontational Piper really stood out from the pack. A tag team match at MSG in March 84 pitted Piper and Schultz against Andre the Giant and Superfly Jimmy Snooker, and the eight-minute no contest garnered the most heat of any match that night. It wasn't long after that that Piper became more of a steady wrestler. But Piper had another outlet to let his unique verbal stylings loose, Piper's Pit. Regarded as the greatest interview segment of all time, the Hot Rod schmoozed with his fellow heels and got under the skin of the babyfaces, producing numerous memorable moments in the process. Perhaps the most famed was his barraging of Jimmy Snooker with insensitive remarks and culminating his goading tirade by blindsiding Superfly with a coconut upside the head. Much of the latter half of 1984 saw Piper and Snooker battle it out across various events, and often extended into tag team matches with Piper doubling up with Orndorff against Snooker and the Tonga Kid, the very 
very young twin brother of Rikishi. Though Piper had wrestled WWE Champion Hulk Hogan a handful of times in late 84 and early 85, their face-off at Madison Square Garden on February 17th, 1985 was all important. Airing on MTV as the war to settle the score, Piper took a DQ loss but set the stage to team with Orndorff at the inaugural WrestleMania. Their opponents? Hulk Hogan and Mr. T. The success of both the match and the event played an enormous part in turning WWE into the powerhouse that it became. And Piper remained the Rock and Wrestling Connection's lead villain, continuing his feud with Hogan throughout 85, while also fending off Orndorff, who'd strayed from Piper and turned babyface following Mania. Piper remained a fixture at major events, going to a double countout with Orndorff on the second ever Saturday night's main event, and getting DQ'd against Hogan at WWE's first true pay-per-view, the Wrestling Classic. He even angered the legendary Bruno Sammartino via off-colour remarks on Piper's pit and lost to the living legend in a steel cage match at Boston Garden in February 86. After Piper got himself disqualified in a boxing match against Mr. T at WrestleMania 2, he took a sabbatical from the business, not returning for nearly four months. But he turned up once again in August 1986, except now he was a babyface. There was no act of charity or valiance that turned him face, but rather that the fans merely treated him as a prodigal son coming home. His gift of garb and his star presence wholly welcomed with massive of cheers. Piper's heroic turn was spelled out in an angle with former on-screen friend Adrian Adonis, whose flower shop talk show had assumed the space once occupied by Piper's pit. Adonis wasn't keen on giving up his spot, and now had Piper's good friend Cowboy Bob Orton watching his back. Orton made it clear that Adonis had offered him a better deal, and suddenly Piper found himself at odds with his old gang. Suddenly, Piper found himself battling the group of familiar heels that were once his friends, including Orton, Don Morocco, and the Iron Sheik. He even teamed with his old nemesis Hulk Hogan to defeat Orndorff and and King Harley Race at Madison Square Garden in the fall of 86. Piper's Pit, now back in its familiar spot, played host to one of the most famous heel turns of all time, as Andre the Giant grimly confronted Hulk Hogan, challenging him to a title match at WrestleMania 3. That date at the Pontiac Silverdome was an important one for Piper as well, as it looked to be the site of his farewell performance. Piper and Adonis were scheduled to meet in a hair versus hair match that, win or lose, was billed as Piper's final wrestling bout. At the age of 32, Piper was looking to go out at the top of his game, in a match with a man he considered his brother outside of the confines of kayfabe. The two had a spirited clash, culminating with Piper, via an assist from Brutus Beefcake, putting Adonis's lights out with a sleeper hold, and after a little haircut, Rowdy Roddy began advancing towards his desired sunset. Sadly, one year later, he would be giving the eulogy at Adonis's funeral, after his good friend was killed in a road accident. The leather jacket that was standard in Piper's wardrobe had been given to him by Adrian. Piper had starred in films before, including the wrestle-centric Body Slam in 86 and the strangely titled Hell Comes to Frogtown the following year. But his most famed movie was released in the fall of 88. John Carpenter's They Live starred Piper as a blue-collar drifter who discovers, with the help of special sunglasses, that society is controlled by well-disguised aliens through manipulation and subtle propaganda. It's, it's a tale as old as time. In a memorable scene, Piper brawls for what seems like an eternity with actor Keith David, all because an annoyed David refuses to put on the magical shade. Five months after They Live hit theatres, however, actor Piper was back to being wrestler Piper. At WrestleMania 5, Piper re-emerged before the wrestling world as part of a lengthy Piper's Pit segment in which he humiliated both Brother Love and caustic talk show host Morton Downey Jr. The following month, he returned to the ring as an active wrestler, working with Ted DiBiase on a series of house shows in California. But his first real feud in his return came with Bobby the Brain Heenan, whom he temporarily replaced as co-host of Primetime Wrestling. Heenan's client, IC champion Rick Rude, insinuated him himself into the ongoing issue, causing Piper to cost him the belt at SummerSlam in a match against the Ultimate Warrior, following a distraction that William Wallace would have been proud of. Piper and Rude battled throughout the final months of 89, captaining opposing Survivor Series teams and going on to settle their grudge in a steel cage match at MSG. Though the two did face off throughout the house show circuit in early 1990, on TV, Piper's new nemesis became Bad News Brown after the pair eliminated one another in that year's Royal Rumble. This led to a rather infamous match at WrestleMania 6, where Piper painted half of his body in what was reportedly a bid to champion people of all backgrounds, but came off, uh, well, it didn't go well. Shortly after WrestleMania 6, Piper took some time away from the ring and ended up assuming color commentator duties on WWE Superstars after Jesse Ventura left the company. He also called the action at SummerSlam 1990 alongside Vince McMahon, as well as that year's Survivor Series and the 91 Royal Rumble with Gorilla Monsoon. It was after the latter event that he began mentoring Virgil, who had finally had enough of Ted DiBiase's arrogant abuse. Piper coached Virgil in matches at WrestleMania 7 against DiBiase and later at SummerSlam 91 from the commentary table, adding much emotion to a match in which Virgil dramatically 
automatically beat DiBiase for the million dollar title. When Ric Flair arrived in WWE at the end of the summer, it didn't take long for he and Piper to renew old hostilities. The two faced off at MSG that fall and captained opposing teams at Survivor Series, with Flair narrowly surviving on a borderline technicality. At the dawn of 92, Piper, substituting for a supposedly ill Bret Hart, defeated the Mountie at the Royal Rumble to become IC champion, and it was his first belt with the promotion. He held onto it into WrestleMania 8 before losing it back to Bret in a very heated good guy versus good guy match, marking one of the rare times that Piper let himself lose cleanly via pinfall. After WrestleMania, Piper left the company again. Appearances became sporadic, whether it was a random guest spot to play bagpipes at SummerSlam 92 in Wembley Stadium, or refereeing the main event of WrestleMania 10 as a surprise appearance. He did have a few feuds left in him, as was the case in 94 when Jerry the King Lawler goaded him into a match at King of the Ring, where Piper vowed to donate his winnings to a children's hospital in Ontario. The following year, Piper officiated a Bret Hart vs. Bob Backlund submission match at WrestleMania 11, comically screaming into the microphone whenever he inquired to either competitor. And following that match, you'll never guess what, Piper was gone once more. He turned up again at the onset of 96, filling in for an injured Gorilla Monsoon as an on-screen figurehead of WWE. He made the Bret Hart Shawn Michaels title match for WrestleMania 12 an Iron Man match, and even physically got involved on the show as well. Entering into a feud with Goldust, the two met in a Hollywood backlot brawl, which gained infamy for Piper being struck by a golden Cadillac, a car chase throughout Anaheim that satirized OJ Simpson's freeway ride, and culminated with Piper stripping Goldust down to his underwear after beating the hell out of him. After WrestleMania, Piper made one last appearance for WWE that August at a stadium show in Toronto. After nearly 13 years of solid connection to WWE, Piper would then make his first appearance in the WrestleMania era for the former Crockett territory that was now WCW. He turned up as a surprise at the end of Halloween Havoc 96, confronting world champion and longtime nemesis Hollywood Hogan, leading to a non-title bout between the two at Starcade, which Piper won with a sleeper hold. He was, however, unsuccessful in attempting to win the belt from Hogan at Super Brawl the following year. From there, Piper was used in big match situations against Hogan, Flair, The Outsiders, and Randy Savage, but by now was approaching his mid-40s. Piper warred with Hogan and the NWO well into 98, even taking part in the unusual three-team war games match at that year's Fall Brawl as part of the WCW faction. The following year, he actually briefly won the US title that he hadn't had in more than a decade and a half, defeating Bret Hart for the gold. He was later involved in a convoluted angle for control of the company involving Flair, Buff Bagwell, Charles Robinson and others, but his last major angle with the company came at the year's end, when he was coerced into reenacting the Montreal Screwjob at Starcade, but this time for Brett's benefit. After leaving WCW in 2000, Piper showed up sporadically for other promotions, including the short-lived XWF in 2001 and infamously in TNA at the end of 2002, where he accused Vince Russo of being responsible for Owen Hart's death. But months later, Piper shocked everybody by turning up at WrestleMania 19 in Seattle, Washington, where he physically involved himself in the Hulk Hogan, Vince McMahon match. A heel once more, Piper mentored Sean O'Hare, but his time with the company proved brief as WWE released him that June, following the airing of a controversial interview on HBO's Real Sports, where he painted a very grim picture of the wrestling industry. Piper and WWE reconciled in 2005, just in time for Roddy to join that year's Hall of Fame class. He also took part in a Piper's pit at WrestleMania 21 with Steve Austin that weekend. One last title run followed for Piper in 2006, where he and Ric Flair defeated the Spirit Squad in order to briefly reign as Raw's tag team champions. From there, Piper made many guest appearances for the company, including a quick spot in the 2008 Royal Rumble match and several more Piper's pit segments, particularly on Legends-themed episodes of WWE programming. His final match came in August 2011, where he and Bob Orton defeated Mick Foley and Terry Funk in a brief match at ICP's Legends and Icons event. But tragically, in July 2015, Roderick George Toombs died in his sleep of an embolism-induced heart attack aged just 61. His quick wit, brash antagonism, fighting spirit, and effortless charm helped shape one of pro wrestling's most unique and colorful legacies. We see characteristics in others that may remind us of Roddy Piper, be it Ronda Rousey carrying on with Piper's blessing, or the audacious mic skills of today's more skillful talkers. But no wrestler could ever duplicate the life and career of Rowdy Roddy Piper, because few others could have conquered the business and the challenges of life alike with his fearless and emboldened nerve. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.